Hello everyone, I'm Brandon K. Hedgepath, lifelong learner, communicator, and of course your friend, and I'm so glad to be here with you all for the Tansen Talks show. And so of course this, you know, the show releases every Saturday, and I'm just so excited to be here. And so to go ahead and get started for today, I want to warmly welcome our guest for today, Nathan Moore. Thank you so much for being here today. Thanks for inviting me on the show, Brandon. Yeah, of course. I'm so glad to have you. And so, first of all, how's your day going so far? Uh, it's going okay. I've got my, my cup of coffee, and I mentioned uh, before we start recording, I'm getting over a cold a little bit, so if I'm a little stuffy, that's that's the story. You are all good. Well, I'm just <laughs> yeah excited to go ahead and you know, speak with you. And so, overall, are you able to take a moment to go ahead and introduce yourself for the watching and listening audience here today? <clears throat> sure. Uh, my name is Nathan Moore. Uh, I'm the general manager of WTJU Radio at the University of Virginia in Charlottesville. Uh, I'm also the staff advisor for WXTJ, which is our all-student-run uh, sister station uh, that I built about 10 years ago. And then uh, I kind of, in my role, oversee the, the podcast collective that we launched back in 2017 as well. Um, and uh, yeah, I've lived uh, in the Charlottesville area for about 12 years now um, as uh, sort of came here for this job. Well, that's just great to hear, and I'm so excited to go ahead and you know dive right into this. And so, yeah, so overall, what really brought you into wanting to do radio? Is this something you always had wanted to do? Uh, <clears throat> so I grew up, you know, I was, I was born in 1980, so I'm kind of like that that exennial, you know, elder millennial kind of thing. Um, so, you know, we always had radio stations around. I always thought it was kind of cool. I went to school with a guy whose dad was a morning show DJ, so it was just kind of a cool thing. Um, but really kind of got me excited about it uh, was a, a different path than I think most people take. Um, I, uh, I really liked the movie pump up the volume with Christian Slater, <laughs> where he runs a pirate radio station out of his basement. Uh, and then I also had some friends in high school who were a year or two older than me. And so they went off to college and, and were telling me stories about uh, just the anarchic stuff that they got to do on their college radio stations. And I just thought it sounded cool. Uh, and so, uh, I kind of wanted to just get into it for that, for that kind of like expression and being on a mic and, and sharing stories and sort of foisting my music taste on an unsuspecting public. Uh, and so um, that was kind of the, the genesis of it. It was uh, uh, just kind of something cool to do. Um, as I got into it, I, I uh, recognized the power a lot more of, of being able to use uh, these media outlets um, as really conveners and, and cultural hubs uh, and spaces where we can kind of like create a new kind of common sense for the communities that we serve. So uh, I definitely grew into to, uh, seeing more of a social impact from it rather than just straight up fun. It's also fun. Well, that's just so interesting to hear that, I mean, that movie was able to help sort of yeah, inspire you to, yeah, to sort of help get you where you are. I mean, that's, that's kind of interesting. As far as uh, uh, kind of teen movies go, it's, it's not a bad one. It's not a bad one. Um, you know, it's a little bit, funny to to say that but yeah i just you know love the idea of like oh, yeah, i was just going to set up a pirate radio station in the basement and then at one point it gets all dramatic the fcc is coming down on him so he puts the broadcasting gear in his in his jeep and is like you know like driving all around doing pirate radio I'm like okay yeah this is cool <laughs> wow that's just so interesting and so and so from that point like did like i guess how did your journey go in terms of trying to i oh, guess sure. make that happen yeah, so when I went, uh, I went to college at, at West Virginia University. I'm originally from that state, and the first week uh, there, I, I stopped by the radio station, and said, "Hey, I'd like to get involved," and and you know, uh, filled out an application, and they brought me on board. My after after uh, oh, about 15 hours of training, my first solo shift was uh, uh, was it Tuesday nights from three to six in the morning. It really kind of sucked as far as the time goes, but um, <laughs> but it was a good place to. Um, you know, try some things and, and, and see what worked. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, five, five thirty, five forty five in the morning when I'm like dying and really want to go to sleep, uh, you know, we can put on some klezmer and dance around the studio and, and just keep it going. Um, but, uh, yeah, it was, a uh, um, uh, space to, and this is one of the things that I think is so great about, uh, college radio in general, wherever it is, um, is that it's a place for students to, um, kind of find their voice, a uh, place to, to kind of you know, come together as a group, come together as a, as a community of, of people who are into you know, good music and, and talk 
programming, but also it crosses all the lines. Like, um, you know, you can pick up skills in, in communication, obviously, right? Public speaking, uh, also tech, also management and, and you know, managing budgets um, and also content and editing um, and lots of creativity as well. So, I mean, it really does kind of you know, cross all the lines of uh, the kinds of things and skills that we uh, want colleges and universities to, to uh, have experiences that, that, that students can enjoy. So I, I love it. I think it's one of the best, the best tools we've got on our, on our campuses. That's so interesting that, you know, that after your training that you start off at the, you know, 2 to 6 a.m. And so how did you manage to get, like, any sleep with that type of um, schedule? <laughs> well, that uh, that semester I had a, a class at 1030 in the morning. So I'd, I'd sleep, like, you know, four hours or so and then and then go to class and then come back and nap. Um, this is the way it went. And that was the only semester I had that, that really terrible shift. Uh, after that, I was able to, to get better ones, 10 to midnights or, or even daytime radio after a while. Um, my second year at, uh, U92, that's the station in, in Morgantown. Um, my second year, I also started helping out with a jazz show and with a, a news talk show. So sort of a public affairs program that we did called, uh, uh feedback. And that's, where I, I, you know, and so really then by my third year, I was hosting a rock show, I was hosting a jazz show, I was co-hosting a talk show, um, and I became the news director on top of all that. <laughs> and so I'd really, uh, um, uh, you know, developed, a, I ended up hanging out at the station quite a lot, uh, my junior and senior years. Um, and, um, you know, again, it's just that, that real wealth of different experiences. I think the only department I really didn't do anything with was the sports department. Uh, yeah, those guys had their own, their own thing set up. Um, but, um, but yeah, we, uh, um, I don't know, I, I caught the bug and, uh, <laughs> you know, got shifts later on that, that allowed for better sleep. That's at least, you know, good to hear. And so during your time, like, you know, doing your studies as well. So did you overall like pick like a communication major or equivalency or did you decide to do uh, different No, my uh, academic background is actually anthropology. Um, so my, uh, I've got a bachelor's degree in anthropology. And then after graduation, I went out to Wisconsin for grad school, uh, also in anthro. And, uh, and so, um, and I was volunteering for, uh, a community radio station out there, which is, um, uh, actually independent from the campus station called WORT. Uh, I was helping, um, produce a, a show where each week a different co-host from the community would just do a show. Uh, it was called the Access Hour. And so literally it was just like, you know, one week it would be somebody talking about how to make paper from scratch. Another week would be a guy sharing Russian reggae. Another week it would be, you know, uh, all, all kinds of different things. Um, and uh, and so I, I was doing that as a volunteer while getting my master's in anthropology. Um, the, the news director full-time job came open uh, the spring of my second year. Uh, so I applied and, and got hired. Um, and so I started as the, the full-time news director, uh, while I still had, um, honestly, a, a couple of months of classes to take and teach. <laughs> um, and I was going to, uh, still pursue the PhD in anthropology. I, I ended up dropping out of the PhD program to just focus full-time on, on community radio. So it's a, it's an unusual path. Um, but that's, that was kind of the gist. Um, and it is kind of funny to think about, yeah, a lot of people, you know, assume or, or would go into communications or media studies or something like that. Um, I think particularly when you're going in, when you have kind of more of a, a public radio um, approach to, to broadcast, um, there's a lot of people with English degrees and with biology degrees and with social science degrees working in public radio these days. And I think a big part of that is just that uh, way that some of those majors encourage you to kind of like think independently and, and, and to uh, be curious, you know, um, I, I've become pals with Bill Seemering, who who wrote uh, NPR's first ever mission statement back in 1970, and um, he said, uh, "Yeah, I said, you know, look, if you're a, a young person today, what's the what's the most important trait in a young person today going into into public radio?" And he said, "Curiosity." Didn't even didn't even pause um, uh, because if you are curious and want to find out more about the world, if you if you meet somebody and you want to hear their story and you want to share their story, uh, great things are going to happen. Um, you know, uh, the, the, the tech and the tools, uh, and the editing software and all that, that's, that's stuff we can teach, but the curiosity is, is really important. And so I think, um, yeah, sometimes the major somebody brings to it is, is way less important than if they have that, that curiosity and that, that, um, 
uh, interest in, in uh, sharing stories. Well, I think that's just such a, I mean, important factor though. I mean, like, I know even for me, like I do literally almost anything and everything in relation to everything that mm-hmm. I do. But I mean, all of it's just because I just enjoy it. I find it interesting. And I mean, it may not even be my focus area, but I mean, just having that general interest and in wanting to explore to learn more. I mean, sometimes that's really all you need. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Um, yeah. So then uh, I was at WORT as the news director for about three years, give or take. Um, my next job was actually at uh, Pacifica Radio, which is a network of, of um, non-commercial stations. Um, they've got five big stations that they own, one in New York, one in D.C., one in Houston, L.A., and the Bay Area, and then about 200 affiliates, um, of which actually that station in Wisconsin, uh, WRT, was an affiliate, so sort of a programming affiliate. Um, and so I was doing national programming work there um, for a couple of years. The national office there was a little bit uh, funky. And so I ended up not keeping that job for for more than a couple of years, but I ended up at the newscast that serves that network. It was called Free Speech Radio News, um, which is no longer up and running, unfortunately. But um, but yeah, for several years, it was a really cool uh, daily half hour newscast um, produced uh, really de- in a decentralized way. So, you know, our producer happened to live in Richmond, Virginia. We had headlines folks out in Oregon. Uh, the tech team was in the Bay Area. Um, I was uh, back in Wisconsin at that point doing the admin and fundraising. <laughs> and uh, um, and so, you know, we all like, um, and this was before Zoom existed. So we had to make do with tools like like Google Chat. <laughs> um, and uh, it worked all right, though. You know, we had to, uh, um, we didn't, we didn't crash the newscast. Somehow we always, you know, kept it going, uh, even with this kind of wild production method. So, um but yeah, so uh, I was there for another couple of years and then got hired on as the general manager at WTJU. Uh, that was back in 2011. The station and UVA were doing a national search for a manager. And, and so, yeah, I started, started running the show here. That's so yeah, interesting to hear how all of that worked out. And, and yeah, and before I actually go further, I did actually have a question for you. So you mentioned a couple of times about, you know, public radio and you know, community mm-hmm. radio and sort of the importance of it. So what would you say for those watching or listening who may not be, you know, I guess familiar, what would you say is like, what is public radio and how does it differ from how you mentioned like community radio and like student affiliate, you know, radio since, yeah, a lot of them have, you know, maybe like a somewhat of a similar purpose, but are implemented in different ways. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, I would say, uh, um, so a lot of people are very familiar with commercial radio stations, right? Uh, so they pick a format and they sell ads and they're trying to boost their audience as much as they can so that they can charge more for those ads. Um, <clears throat> with the, the, the broad non-commercial radio system, uh, these are really organizations where the mission comes first and we trigger, uh, then we figure out how to fund it. So, <clears throat> you know, in, in terms of each, each, Station will have its own twist on 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 a mission. At WTJU, you know, our mission is to uh, extend UVA's educational mission and bring people together, uh, bring communities together through excellent music and conversation. Um, other, you know, news oriented stations will mention kind of news and information more explicitly, um, but there's always this sense that we're uh, uh, trying to uh, uh, make stronger communities, knit them together into healthier, more sustainable places where everyone can thrive. Um, now, uh, the, when we talk about public radio, that usually refers to like NPR affiliates. So, you know, stations that play Morning Edition, all things considered. Um, but technically, part of the, the public radio system also includes, you know, what I would call community radio stations like WTJU, where um, there's dozens and dozens, if not hundreds of volunteers coming in to make programming. Um, and that can be different formats. Often it's music heavy, but sometimes there's news and public affairs departments as well. Um, Again, different model, just kind of like really boots on the ground, often smaller budgets, <laughs> um, but really uh, uh, trying to bring it all kind of like from the people and and, and share these, um, uh, you know, again, it's all just like sharing connections. Um, college radio is a specific kind of non-commercial radio as well that that is literally just at, you know, based at college radio, uh, rather colleges and universities. Um, within college radio, you know, a lot of those NPR affiliates are based at colleges. But then I think what we think of when we think college radio 
is the kind of like like you know low budget free form student radio you know like like you know 19 20 year olds coming in and just doing like wild stuff on air um and having a good time with it you know uh and that's that's the case for wxtj and my student station um you know we uh, uh it's pretty free form you know sometimes I'll, I'll come in and they're just like playing kind of straight ahead indie rock uh sometimes it's edm uh so, sometimes like like old school classic hip-hop tracks uh, one time the DJ had, had like raided our vinyl library collection and was playing like traditional Swiss folk tunes on, on vinyl. Um, so yeah, it, it can really be all kinds of, of content and, uh, genre. Um, uh, but again, really just a place for students to, um, uh, share their passion and try things out. Um, and then, you know, WXTJ too, just in the last couple of years, as the, the pandemic crisis has somewhat abated, um, has really been a place for students to, organize around uh sort of creating a, a, a campus community um, beyond just the broadcast you know and so um lots of uh house shows uh lots of, of sort of like live video concert recordings taking place through wxtj sort of above and beyond the broadcast i mean they're going on like hikes together and stuff but that has very little to do with <laughs> you know getting on a microphone uh it's just a, a, a place for um kind of those social connections that, that make it all make it all work but at least you know they're able to yeah stay connected you know both yeah. with each other and yeah and the public for those you know who are listening i mean and i mean it's still rather cool that they're able to get these experiences especially early on mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah absolutely it's a uh, um uh you know again we we um i feel like like in our society, we, we, we have lots of technological connections, right? Like I can open my phone and get an app and find a particular song in like, what, three, four clicks. Um, but even as we're more technologically connected, I, I find that we're still often like very socially atomized as people, um, very kind of isolated from one another. And so I think any um, you know institution, any kind of organization whose purpose and mission is to, to you know, weave these stronger connections. I think that's so important right now. Um, and, and to have connections that are also positive, you know, and such that we can, uh, everybody can, can lead better lives. Uh, that's really kind of what the whole point of it is, you know, like, yeah, it's fun. Yeah. We want to go on air and, and make good radio, but there, there's a point here too. And that's to, 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 to serve our societies with, with, um, ways that we can all belong and thrive. Yeah. Um, because there's so much lack of connection and there's so much toxic out there uh, that if we can use our, our media outlets for, for something better, then that's, that's the, that's the mission. Yeah. I mean, but that certainly is a great mission though. And yeah, so it's so interesting to, you know, hear about that. And I definitely wanted to make sure that, you know, I had asked that question because I believe that, you know, having, you know, broadcast as, you know, very community based, I think just so important for both the, the community and for those involved in it. I mean, it just helps bring up that experience, but also kind of makes a deeper connection than, yeah, than just a traditional, like, yeah, like national broadcast. I mean, it's truly their local and for the people. Yeah. Yeah. And it's funny if you, if you look at the, the history of broadcast in the U S too, um, those early days, the 1920s, 1930s, before everything went kind of network, you know, radio stations in these little towns were, were doing a lot of exactly that, you know, they were, uh, you know, professors would go on and, and talk about their work, uh, you know, out in the Midwest, there'd be grain market reports, you know, uh, across the country, there'd be, you know, choirs and singing groups and, and, um, you know, a lot of stuff that was just what the people were interested in and wanted to talk about in those towns. Um, you know, the consolidation of media into, into these networks that were, that were expansive and, and, uh, wide ranging. I think, you know, obviously some strengths came with that. You could develop sort of a national culture and there were some like, you know, shows that became national hits, um, and just more production resources to go around. But, uh, but you know, there's something lost when you lose that, that local texture. Um, and in the commercial radio space, uh, a lot of that local texture has really been lost since 1996 with the uh, telecommunications act of, of 96, um, which enabled, uh, really big companies to buy up tons and tons of radio stations um, and just kind of, you know, run everything from network. You know, one of my old uh, friends from my college radio days, you know, works for one of those networks now. And 
And uh, he's actually a DJ. He's one of a very small number of people in the country who has full-time work as a DJ. And the way it works is that he is the local DJ on like 36 stations, you know, ranging from Maine to, to uh, Arizona. Um, and that's, I mean, he does a great job. He has a great voice. You know, I, I appreciate what he does, but like, you know, that's not, that's not the local I'm talking about. <laughs> um, I think, uh, uh, having, um, stations like, like mine, where, where the point really is to have this two way street with the people that, that live right here. Um, it's, it's something special. Yeah. I mean, that's just so, it's just so interesting. And as someone myself, a self-described research enthusiast, I am very familiar with the telecommunications act of 96 <laughs> and certainly did sort of set the pathway for where we are now for better or worse. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, there's a uh, um, any kind of big big change like that. You see, who benefits, who doesn't benefit, and, and in this case, the benefit really was, you know, the big companies. <laughs> yeah, that that is for sure. But right now, you are, of course, the general manager of WTJU, and so first of all, how has it been being within this role? Oh, good. Uh, you know, it's, a. Uh, um, I, I love, I love hanging around, uh, people who have this kind of passion and, and knowledge and just want to share it. Uh, it takes a certain kind of, um, uh, quirky individual to like, you know, kind of look at a, at a town and, and, and look at a, a group of people and say, I want to, I want to kind of, you know, volunteer on a, on a microphone and <laughs> share music or stories that, that are important. Um, uh, you know, it's like kind of a, an odd, like outsider insider, uh, personality that, that all these folks, uh, tend to bring. Uh, and I, I like being surrounded by people like that. Um, and so, uh, you know, there's challenges for sure. I would say, uh, at, at this being a, a university licensee in particular, um, we have some, some really good perks that come with that. You know, there's some stability. Um, we do receive a certain amount of money in student fees, although the, the lion's share of the money in our budget is money we have to raise ourselves. Um, but, um, uh, but yeah, it's a great space for me to uh, be engaged creatively in, in this kind of community building endeavor. Um, and you know, like any job, there's, there's some stuff that sucks, <laughs> uh, you know, and I have to be the arbiter, the, the sort of mediator between two people who are, you know, having a hard time with each other, or when I have to, uh, deal with university bureaucracy that can be a pain in the neck. Um, but like truly most of the, of the work I do, I really love what I do. Yeah. Well, I'm glad that you enjoy what you do. And I know that yeah, that UVA had put out a University of Virginia had put out like a nationwide search for yeah you know, for even finding your position. So how mm -hmm. did you know that when yeah you know, when they were looking that this is this is something that you'd be interested in, especially because I believe you mentioned prior to this point you were in Wisconsin. Was yeah, and uh, I had been working for Free Speech Radio News. The you know I could see organizationally it was just kind of teetering financially. I was like, eh, I need to start looking. I need to start looking, and um. Uh, and so there's a few, uh, places that, that, that most, uh, public radio stations post their jobs. Um, the CPB's job line, the corporate for public broadcasting, um, that's a, a big clearinghouse for a lot of public radio, public media in general jobs. And, uh, yeah, I was kind of looking at it and, and it's one of those where my, um, uh, sort of diversity of work experiences actually was super helpful. I'm looking at the qualifications of this. I'm like, I'm only 30. Do you think I can actually like run a whole station? I was like, well, I've, I've done budgets and managed budgets. Uh, I've done fundraising and, and pledge drives. Um, I've done like FCC related and, and tech work. Uh, and I've done a lot of volunteer management. And those are like the four main areas that, that were in the job description. I'm like, I think actually I could probably do this. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's one where I think just having that, you know, I spent my 20s just just building up a whole diverse set of skills. Um, and, and so it was the right fit at the right time. But well, that's so good to hear. And I was definitely doing, you know, some research into the history of the station as well. And so I believe if I remember correctly, you know, that you are the, you know, the third over, overall full-time um, general manager for the station. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, so the station had a uh, student general managers for many decades. The station won the air in 1957 and there'd be a, a student director for a year, maybe two. Um, and, you know, a lot of different department directors as well, rock department, classical department, and so on. Um, 
But yeah, that changed in the early 90s. Uh, UVA hired a guy named Chuck Taylor to be the GM. Uh, and it's not just a shoe, it's also a, a person. Um, and so Chuck was WTJU's uh, full-time uh, manager for about 17 years, quite a while. Uh, and he retired in 2010. Um, UVA hired a, a, a GM for that interim period, 2010, and I guess the late 2010, um, who only stayed for six months. It wasn't a good fit. Um, um, and actually, that person's tenure led to some uh, real conflict at the station. So I came in kind of with this, this um, uh, you know, uh, some some healing to be done, <laughs> uh, some process work on like how to had a sort of like, you know, herd the cats in a way that everybody feels heard and empowered and, and um, like they're part of uh, part of this and not just being told, you know, X, Y, and Z. Um, and so that was really my charge. Um, and I came in and, and, you know, worked and listened for a, a full year to kind of what people's needs were before making program schedule changes. Um, and also pretty quickly worked to, to upgrade some of our tech systems that had been pretty um, uh, minimal for, you know, backups and things like that. And it's been an ongoing process. I mean, you know, to, to spend time at a radio station like this is to always be chasing some tech issue, but. <laughs> well, nevertheless, though, I mean, you've been there for now about 12, 11, 12 years. Yeah. 12 years now. Yeah. And so overall, like, I guess, what was something that when you came in, I guess may have shocked you or you weren't aware about you know, yet by the time that you had, come in um there's a, a one thing that i want to tell a story that's kind of fun because it, it it's um so the station had no backup uh studio transmitter link at all so the way this works is you've got a studio and in most cases the transmitter the fm transmitter is like up on a mountain somewhere right and so you have to get audio from from point a to point b it's called an stl studio transmitter link and at the time we were using a, a closed circuit t1 line just like a um, uh, like a low speed internet connection, but not going out to the public internet, just like a point to point um, T1. And, uh, and there's a, a device on either side. Well, there's a lightning strike and it ended up frying the power supply for the device up on Carter mountain, which is where our transmitter is. And uh, I was like, well, that sucks, you know, <laughs> and our engineer, you know, we were up there and he said, well, you know, we can order this and have them overnighted and you'll be off the air for about two days, maybe three days. And I was like, oh, that, that sucks. Like, we're just going to say, Oop, we're off air. Uh, and I was like, you know, we're, we're still web streaming, like the, the stream server is uh, unaffected. And so, uh, I was like, you know, I bet we could, why don't I just play the stream through my phone, which I, I, I could do up on Carter mountain. Uh, so this is back in the iPhone four days. <laughs> and so, uh, so yeah, I started playing the stream on my phone and then just plugged it into the back of the FM transmitter. Um, I was like, oh, well now we have a backup. <laughs> uh, and people love that. It, it felt like, it did feel kind of like magic to, to be able to, you know, pull that together. Um, but the, um, uh, you know, we, we've since upgraded that to a better system, uh, where, you know, it's like multiple 4G hotspots, things like that. But, uh, but yeah, at the time it was just like, oh yeah. And, and I also forgot to, and I didn't really think about it at first. Uh, I forgot to turn on call, uh, forwarding. And so whenever somebody would call me, the, the radio station would fade down, ring for 30 seconds, and then fade back up. Um, so, you know, those are just kind of like like tech growing pains <laughs> that you learn along the way. Um, I think, too, uh, uh, one thing I was really pleased about um, with uh, as, the, as the radio station kind of grew up and, and when I first got there um, was how much people really cared about it, you know? Um, and I, and I, I knew that there had been a big conflict. Um, in fact, there was a, a blog called save WTJU that was great reading material for my job interviews. <laughs> um, but, uh, uh, yeah. And I knew there'd been a lot of conflict. I knew people had gotten very organized. Um, and what that translated to was, uh, you know, I, when I when I arrived, I was able to see, oh, there's a lot of like like shared values here already. You know, like there's a lot of that uh, passion and caring that's already in place. I don't have to build that yet. Right. Um, and we can you know, hopefully tap into some of those shared values and do some good work together. So it's good. Um, you know, I think with a, a conflict like there was, I think uh, at one point, you know, the, the uh, UVA was kind of like, is this radio station more trouble than it's worth? But um and I guess it, the, their answer got pretty close at, at one time before I got here. Um, I'm, I'm pleased to say that now we, we've shown our value in a number of ways. Um, 
So yeah, these days uh, we actually produce uh, the President Jim Ryan's podcast. So um, you know, yeah, we're we're valuable. <laughs> Well, that is really cool. And I guess to touch on, you know, I guess what you just mentioned. So, so how long has, you know, has the College Presidents podcast been going on? Uh, this school year is the second year uh, of it. Um, and then we've expanded it. Now we also do uh, one with the provost office called uh, Who's in STEM um, with uh, Professor Ken Ono, who's doing this obviously STEM initiative through the provost office. Um, we've got about 17 podcasts currently in active production. Um, that was one thing that also kind of surprised me. So we, we started this podcast collective in 2017, and I really thought it would just be a, a good resource for anybody interested to come have some free studio time. And, and we'll also distribute to Apple podcasts and, and Spotify and all the rest for free. Um, we'll offer some training workshops for free. Um, but, you know, that was just kind of thought it'd be a good, a good resource like that. And we do have some people that do that, people who wanted to make a podcast and they affiliate and, and that's what they do. Um, what I was kind of surprised by was how many UVA departments um, wanted to have a podcast, but not actually do the production work. <laughs> and so in some cases, they, they, they pay us, uh, you know, uh, extra money, to, uh, essentially for our staff time to, to be the actual producer. Um, and so that's actually been a nice little extra uh, revenue stream, um, you know, just to, to keep things going. Um, so yeah, it's good, though. I mean, again, once you sort of once the word kind of gets out that you're uh, the spot for, for audio uh, on a campus, then, you know, it's a good reputation to have. Well, that is just you know, really interesting to hear. And yeah, I think like with the especially the expansion of all the technological services and, you know, the rise of things like even podcasting that I think everyone sort of really wants to get into it. But but at the same time, I don't know if everyone realizes actually how much work it is to actually, you know, go into it, produce it, if you want guests to book guests and oh, the yeah. whole process. For sure. For sure. And I love uh, the show uh, Only Murders in the Building. I think it's very funny and, and you know, clever. But uh, the way they show podcast production, it's like, you know, it's just Steve Martin holding up a phone for a while. And then, ta-da, it's a podcast that has a million listeners. It's like, that's a few things missing there. <laughs> um, it is, it is. And one thing about podcasts in particular is you really have to like earn every listener. Um, I got a little bit, um, uh, oh, I guess, spoiled by broadcast where, <clears throat> you know, you open up the mic, you're doing a show, you know, there's at least a couple hundred people out there listening and and uh, just because they already know and, and love the station and its brand. Um, but, uh, but yeah, with podcasts, I mean, it's, it's every single one. <laughs> yeah, that is, that is for sure. And yeah, I definitely have, will have a question about that, you know, momentarily. So I do know that as we somewhat mentioned earlier, that, that your station, you know, sort of has a you know, unique standing in the sense that, that you all have both a community radio station and a mm -hmm. student wet station as well. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, that is unusual for sure. Um, uh, there are definitely some schools where there's like a big NPR affiliate next to a, a student station. Um, not very many. In fact, I can only think of uh, three or four uh, in the country that, that kind of have the, the volunteer community radio model paired with an all student model. Um, and because of that, and I think, you know, you and I have gotten to know each other some through um, a, a nonprofit I started called the Virginia College and Community Radio Alliance. Um, I was just kind of casting around and realized, you know, there's like 19 college radio stations in Virginia. Um, and, <clears throat> you know, I, I could see that, that sometimes, um, you know, certain stations will have like really excited, really involved students. And then they graduate and the institutional knowledge is gone. Right. And so things come up like, how do I build a new studio? How do I report this stuff to the FCC? And like, they just don't know. Um, and so, uh, you know, I started that really just as a way to kind of be a resource where we could kind of learn from each other and have a peer network. Um, and because WTJU is, uh, you know, at this point, a pretty large operation, I wanted to you know, kind of pay it forward a little bit um, with resources. And so, yeah, when there's a, a you know, I got a, a call from a guy uh, at, at Mary Washington who, uh, you know, um, wanted to figure out how to like get streams and studios working better. And then, so, you know, I just did a little one hour tech consult and there we go. 
uh, William and Mary's station was moving. And again, they needed a whole consult on like how to build a studio and stuff. And they've also got some other issues with their, with their FM. And so, you know, again, I just, I can connect them to engineers and, and in some cases, you know, do a little bit of the work myself. <laughs> Well, how cool is that that you're able to be a resource for all of these different stations for yeah college radio in Virginia and one in West Virginia? <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> That's my alma mater. So uh, yeah, um, Alex, the the manager of, of WVU's station, kind of caucuses with, <laughs> with this group. Uh, I think just you know again, um, uh, people are kind of hungry for for that connection and learning from each other. Yeah, I mean, but nevertheless, I mean, it's just such a great resource. And yeah, I'm glad that, you know, with this, you're sort of able to take, you know, to operate for not just your community and for UVA and Charlottesville, but through, you know, but for your nonprofit network, you're able to, yeah, I mean, just help out, you know, College Radio in Virginia and just sort of help us boost our own communities as well. <laughs> well, uh, I'm glad you're, I'm glad you're there for it. <laughs> and yeah, we do have, uh, we've been getting together, you know, every uh, October just for like a little afternoon Zoom conference. Um, and yeah, it's a nice, nice way to make a connection, um, you know, and, and just so many of us are dealing with the same difficulties, uh, whether that's, um, you know, administrations that don't really understand what we do or, uh, you know, tech stuff or, you know, fundraising stuff or, couple of years ago, you know, how to keep going during COVID, you know, and how to bounce back once we were allowed back in. And so, you know, just learning from each other just makes a lot of sense to me. Well, I'm so glad that you are and, you know, that you are able to continue to learn from that. And so out of curiosity, how was like, I guess, the figuring out process, trying to figure out everything like in, I guess, March and April 2020, like, what do oh, we goodness. do at this point? <laughs> well, we actually, um, uh, so some stations just like completely shut down their studios and just did only pre-record, only remote stuff. We did not take that that approach. We actually still had, you know, one one host at a time was allowed to come in. Um, we also set up um, a lot of remote broadcast uh, operations. Uh, so a, a $50 USB microphone and uh, the software called Mixler, um, we could essentially have somebody run a broadcast live from their laptop from anywhere, home or or you know, the dorm or whatever. Uh, and so at one point I think we had 70 DJs that were each like patching in using, uh, the Mixler streams. Um, and so, you know, like the student station, there would be one in the studio and then one from home and then one in the studio and then one from home. So there really was no transmission of, of COVID happening, uh, in the studios. And that way we were able to, to keep it going, to keep the, the radio, um, alive and, and thriving. And I think, um, you know, for XTJ and for TJU both, uh, finding ways to connect during that time was just so critical. And so, you know, it, it, just the, the comfort of hearing a, a familiar voice, the comfort of, of hearing um, uh, music, it was such a respite for, for people's souls at a time that was really difficult. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's funny, I, we, we, we ordered so many USB microphones that my uh, Amazon Alexa device uh, started like sending me notifications once a month. Like, it looks like it's time for you to buy more five fine USB microphones. I'm like, it's not, <laughs> I'm not running a microphone store. Uh, we just, we just needed a lot of them, uh, at once. Um, you know, yeah, that was such a stressful time. And I think, uh, I told all of our DJs this, I kind of put this in a, a letter toward the end of the year. It's that, you know, there's a lot of ways that we all got through that, that year, 2020, uh, a lot of people, made sourdough bread, you know, a lot of people uh, got really charged up about um, some social justice things that needed to happen that year. Um, uh, a lot of people just, you know, binged watch, you know, Netflix or whatever. And those are all fine things to do and important things to do. Um, you know, I was really proud that at that moment, though, we could also help people feel connected, you know, uh, help people feel like they were a part of a place that, that cared about them. Um, and to provide like literal resources, like, Hey, if you are having a hard time mental health wise, here's a lot of, of resources in the community that you can call right now. Um, if you have the opportunity to give help, here's a lot of ways you can do that right now. Um, and so, you know, I think, uh, in an emergency, um, and that was a certain type of emergency, right? Uh, not the kind of, we usually think of like wildfires or, or floods, or whatever, but it was a different kind of emergency in them. Um, really proud of the work we were able to, to do, not just at my station, but, but 
you know, kind of a lot of them. Yeah, I mean, but at least you were able to get through that time and, I mean, continue striving. Yeah, yeah, that's the idea. Yeah, and so I did want to ask, so what is sort of the relationship that your station has with the student station um, WXTJ? So they're, I mean, the studios are like, like right across the hall from each other. Um, so we see each other all the time. Um, the leadership of the student station does really run XTJ on its own, in its own way. Um, you know, I try to be there as a support. Uh, I, I tend to be the one to file like the FCC updates and stuff like that. Um, but I don't, I don't get in the way of their programming. Uh, that's, that's really all student, student control. Um, uh, I'd say the, um, you know, so we do have several people on paid staff at, at WTJU. And so WXTJ can can lean on us for whatever they might need. Often that's tech stuff, um, studio equipment that goes awry, uh, or they need to borrow a, a turntables and, and PA system for a, an event that weekend. Uh, and so my, you know, my, my operations guy can hook them up with all that. Um, programming wise, there's not a whole ton of overlap. Um, Sometimes we'll have a, an XTJer who wants to uh, kind of be on the the, the, the big signal, uh, and so sometimes there's a little bit of, of, of feed in from from that population onto onto ninety one point one. But um, but yeah, it's it's kind of its own cool thing too. That's so cool, and I know that you all also have a Charlottesville Classical Station as well. Yeah, yeah. So that's a, a web only, um, and. Um, Essentially, what we do is we we take the classical programming from um, from WTJU, like a regular FM uh, classical radio, uh, and then we kind of arrange it in a in a schedule that's a, essentially a twenty four seven stream um, with you know several reruns and then a handful of, of web original shows as well. Um, uh, that's trying to uh, really grow uh, and serve the the classical music community in Charlottesville. Um, there is another. Uh, classical music service on the radio in in Charlottesville uh, comes out of Roanoke on, on WVTF Music. We're we're one of two markets in the entire country where classical music is competing with classical music on air. <laughs> um, and we decided a few years ago that one way that we can really differentiate ourselves is is um, uh, to to really serve the local classical community as best we can. Um, so that's what that's about. Um, we don't really have uh, the only live hosting on that that stream is is when it coincides with live classical you know on on wtju fm but nevertheless though between your you know your two traditional stations your you know the online station everything else i mean it sounds like you all certainly have you know quite a you know, a decent sized operation you know between all of the different ones and it sounds like charlottesville is really like the hub for a community and college radio i hope so um yeah no we do have a lot of content brands for sure um, I think that's okay. Um, we, uh, and that's, that's just part of it. We also run a pretty robust, uh, educational program. So every summer we've got three weeks of summer camps for upper elementary and middle school kids. Uh, this summer for the first time, we're inviting, uh, high school, uh, teens to host shows on WXTJ when the UVA students are mostly gone. Um, and, um, uh, we also have, um, uh, some classes we teach in conjunction with uh, UVA's Lifetime Learning Institute that we use our stage for, um, which is sort of a classroom space. I teach a class every January, a J-term class uh, on sound production and storytelling. So, you know, in addition to being like an educational radio station, we're really also bringing that educational component, um, you know, right there to, um, uh, to, to grounds in the case of UVA. Uh, that's actually really interesting. Are you actually able to tell us a little bit more about that class? That sounds really interesting. Oh, sure. <laughs> uh, yeah, let's see. It would have been in 2020, right before the pandemic started, was the first time I taught it. Uh, it's an entire three-credit semester class crammed into like nine days. Um, it's what it's just a thing UVA offers. Starts like right after New Year's, and then this is that two-week period before um, before the full spring semester starts. Um, it's fun. It's, it's honestly kind of like going to camp <laughs> with the, with the students. At least that's what they've told me. Uh, cause you know, we come in and, and we're working, you know, five hours a day on, on making podcasts. Um, but yeah, so it covers a lot of different things from listening, uh, is a big thing to start with. Um, 
and then you know like a structure of a story like how do you actually make a story like what's the arc um interviewing skills writing for the ear uh how to actually use the recorders and tech and audio software and so by the end of week one we've kind of covered all the all the kind of core skills of, of audio production and then by week two um the students are really making something creative uh and so this year uh, this year I, I, I turned the students pretty loose. I was like, look, I'm, I'm going to let y'all produce whatever podcast format you want. Um, and, and we will, you know, <laughs> so they're, they're, they're going to sound different from each other. They're not all going to be like an NPR story. Um, but they were good. Like they're all very good. Um, one was this, uh, uh, uh really cool, uh, uh, first episode of a, of a podcast about different rhythm patterns, um, and, uh, and, and music. And, and so, you know, featured some in-depth interviews with some percussionists about, uh, you know, the particular um, uh, uh, drum pattern. Um, another was uh, uh, just like a cool monologue, a uh, history monologue about about the GOAT, uh, this uh, most famous basketball player, best basketball player to never play in the NBA. Um, I also had a couple of um, audio dramas in the mix, which was very ambitious on, on the part of, of those students. But yeah, we had kind of a mix of everything. Um, and, uh, you know, again, it's just one of those things where even if the students never, you know, are employed at some future places like a producer or, you know, uh, a podcast creator or whatever, but they have the skills to do that, you know, um, any kind of job that requires communication or leadership, you're going to want to be able to tell a story You're going to want to be able to like, you know, think about your audience and how you're reaching them and why, um, and, and the way you're going to do that, <laughs> uh, effectively. And so, you know, those are really the skills that it's about. Um, and again, I think just uh, we can use these stories and, and this audio to, um, uh, to connect people with one another. I think that's, that's key. Well, nevertheless, though, that's just great that you're able to have these opportunities and, yeah, and that the students are able to truly strive and the community as well. And so, and so I guess my last question, just as a, I guess, a follow-up for one that for something that you'd mentioned earlier um, mm -hmm. before I go ahead and, you know, begin closing this out is that, you know, with the production of, you know, like these new podcasts and new formats that keep coming out, how, how does this sort of coincide or work alongside like the more traditional radio operations that you all do? Because it's like, they're both audio formats for the most part um, with some exceptions, but it's different at the same time. Oh, sure. Sure. Um, yeah, I mean the tools are very similar, right? Uh, the microphone's a microphone. Editing stuff in 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 our case, uh, Adobe Audition is the same for either way. Um, you know, our our flagship and really the the, the thing we're, we're best known for, and the thing that brings in the most donations, is the FM radio stations, right? And the the, the simulcast web streams that go with them. Uh, podcasts, um, we have some that do well. In fact, one in the collective just just won a, a Webby award, which was cool. Um, <laughs> but, uh, um, but, you know, to get more than a, a couple thousand listeners, in fact, in most of those cases, like a couple thousand listeners will be amazing. Uh, the podcast I hosted for a long time until I just turned it over to one of my staffers, uh, was a state politics explainer and our typical episode got like 500 listens, you know? So this is not like big earth shaking numbers. Um, but you know, it's still something that's, that's pretty cool. Um, the, um, it's tough in the podcast uh, market. Uh, you know, during the pandemic, literally a million people started new podcasts. <laughs> um, and so, you know, when you've got sort of the, the long tail that's that long, uh, standing out and getting noticed and, and uh, being able to keep it up and, and not just sort of fade. Uh, I see you've been doing yours for six years now. That's crazy long for a uh, for a podcast, you know, most, um, most podcasts, you know, start to fade out after six or seven episodes. So, you know, the producer just gets kind of tired and, and, you know, you can do anything for half a dozen and then it's like, you know, kind of really staying with it is, is, uh, is where it's, it, you have to show up. Um, but, uh, you know, I guess that's, that's not a real clear answer, but I think my main answer there is just, um, uh, we're still trying to figure out some of the, um, uh, how to make the, the the marketplace of podcasting work for us. Obviously we're a, a very indie operation with very low budget for that. And so we're, we're, uh, we're not playing the, the, the giant, um, uh, kind of, um, uh, chasing venture capital for, you know, like the next big hit thing. That's not the model we do. We're just trying to be a platform for uh, community voices and telling good stories. 
Well, that's nevertheless, I mean, yeah, just, I mean, overall, I'm just very intrigued by how, yeah, how you all run and operate and especially all the work that you do, you know, both, yeah, in front of the microphone and behind the scenes. I mean, it's just overall really fascinating. And yeah, and I completely agree with what you're saying in terms of podcasting, because it definitely, like, I don't know, it's very unrealistic, like you're saying, like, for your show Only Murders in the Building, where it's just like, oh, yeah, we can just record something real quick, get a couple thousand (laughs) people, like, I I wish it was that simple, but... Right, right. (laughs) Yeah, I'd say the, um, uh, always, um, uh, you know, I think, I think we're going to keep doing podcasting, of course, right? But I think the, uh, in the early days, like 2017, 2018, it's like, oh, maybe we'll get like a, a sponsor who like buys ads for all these. And like, nobody's doing that. That's not how we, I think we would do a lot better to focus on on Patreon mm-hmm. and kind of building up that, that donor community um, rather than trying to sell ads. Cause that's not, that's not us, you know? That is so true. And so, you know, beginning to close out this episode though, if anyone would like to, you know, continue, continue hearing, you know, your story or, you know, follow you online. Is there anywhere that people can do so? If not, that's quite all right as well. I at least want to provide that opportunity. All right. That is great to hear. And so I, and I presume that they have a social media presence, of course, yeah, yeah. social media. <laughs> yeah. WTG is on Facebook and Instagram for sure. We, we recently decided to, to stop using Twitter, but yeah. Yeah, that is, you know, great to hear. And so to close out our episode, I did want to provide an opportunity for you to go ahead and leave us with a closing, yeah, a closing thought, whether it be, you know, a life lesson, inspirational thought, or, you know, a quote, the, the floor is all yours. Oh, gosh, sure. Um, you know, I, I uh, uh, occasionally just in my job, I've been doing this long enough, somebody will ask, you know, like, like about career advice or uh, how uh, how I got to where I am, you know? Uh, and, and you, like I've mentioned like the path I took, the specific steps are, are literally not there anymore. You can't, you can't copy them. Um, but that said, I think, you know, there's a lot of advice out there like, Oh, do what you love. And I'm like, eh, kind of, that's, that's part of it. You don't want to do something you hate, you know, like at the end of the work day, you don't want to come home and be like, ah, oh, I hate what I do. Um, so you want to, you know, enjoy it somehow. But I think for me, um, what we want is to, to, to do something that will eventually be meaningful to us. Um, and the way I recommend we do that is, is we find a group of people who we can care about and who cares about us. And then we make her do something useful for them. And in doing that, in, in finding some kind of work or some kind of vocation outside of our paid work, uh, where we can make her do something useful for people we care about, um, that's where the meaning happens, you know? And then that thing becomes the thing that you love. And then you're doing the thing you love. <laughs> uh, but for me, so much of it is about kind of turning outward and, and uh, how, can we, um, how can we build those connections and, and help, help one another um, in, this, in this path? Well, thank you so much, like I said, for coming on to the show and for speaking with us. I definitely appreciate this opportunity. And yeah, definitely continue doing just the amazing work that you're doing. Oh, Brandon, thank you. You too. Thank you so much. For those of you watching or listening, thank you all so much, as always, for tuning into the show. And I can't wait to speak with you all next week. Until next time, have a wonderful day, everyone, and let's make things happen. I'll see you all later. Take care. <laughs>